My goal for this video is to make it one of the best resources on the entire internet for understanding and addressing this thing that goes by several different terms. It could be a rotated pelvis, asymmetrical hips, lateral pelvic tilt, etc. What these things are ultimately describing is the same thing, which is a pelvis that is no longer in a neutral position, meaning that it is rotated one way or the other and it is higher on one side, lower on the other side. And there are different implications that can happen as a result of this, which I'm going to discuss and also give you the tools to understand what's happening with your own body. Now I'm gonna bring this up now and also later in the video so that you're perfectly aware that I'm writing an accompanying article to this video. And it's going to have a lot more information, a lot more exercises, stuff that's going to help you understand and implement this content more effectively. And that allows me to condense this video into a digestible format that allows me to really address the key points. Now let's first define what even is this situation? What is it representing? And I like to make it very, very simple. I like to think about it like we are shifted or lateralized towards one side of our body more than the other. You can think about it like this. If I'm going to shift into my right side, certain things are going to happen. I'm going to have a higher right hip on this right side. My right shoulder is probably going to drop and my head is going to side bend to the other side. What this represents within the hips is an internally rotated position of the pelvis. So if I hike up my hip and drop my shoulder, both my shoulder and that hip are going to be in a position of internal rotation. So these bones of the humerus and femur are going to rotate inwards more so relative to the other side. Now in order to balance ourselves out, our head is going to side bend to the other side. So you can think about this like, again, lateralization towards one side. And what this actually is very similar to is mid stance phase of gait on that side. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say I'm taking a step forward with my right leg. When I strike the ground, I'm in more of an externally rotated position on this side of my body. But as I start to load more weight onto this side, what happens is I need to acquire internal rotation of my hip. So as I load my weight on there, my hip is going to very subtly rise on that side. My shoulder is very subtly going to drop. My head's gonna very subtly side bend to the other side as I start to bring this side through. So this represents what happens when we are literally shifted over to one side of our body when we're walking in the gait cycle. Now, as I go towards the other side, my shoulder would start to rise. I would become more neutral, external rotation on this side. Then I would go into internal rotation on the other side. And as we are more weight bearing on that side and gait in mid stance, that's more of an internally rotated position. So the other side will be in more relative amounts of external rotation of the hip. Therefore, whatever side we're shifted towards is going to have more internal rotation based measurements if we were to just assess range of motion. And the other side would have more external rotation based measurements. Now, when I say internal rotation based measurements, I mean, obviously internal rotation of your hip, but also a straight leg raise, because in order to get beyond a 45 degree straight leg raise, we actually have to move into more of an internally rotated position of our femur. So the more you get beyond 45 degrees, usually the more internal rotation you have at your hip. Now, external rotation based measurements mean obviously external rotation at the hip, but also hip flexion. So hip flexion represents the ability for the femur to progressively externally rotate more and more the closer you bring it towards your chest. So this is also a representation of hip external rotation. Now we also have to use the upper body to confirm what we're seeing at the lower body, because obviously the upper body will be affected if your hips are in an asymmetrical position. Think about it like this. If I put my arms in this position right here and I turn towards the right side, my arms would do this. So this is external rotation on my right shoulder, internal rotation on my left shoulder. So this would mean that if I was turned towards the right side, I would have better internal rotation on my opposite side and better external rotation on the side that I am turned to. In this example, it's my right side. Also, I would have better shoulder abduction on the side I'm turned towards. The reason for this is because shoulder abduction is a representation of how well your sternum can turn towards that side. So think about it like this. If my trunk was turned towards the right side, my shoulder abduction would be more easy on that side. But on the left side, wouldn't be as good because I can't turn towards that side as well. I go over how to do these assessments extensively and accurately within the article I'm writing alongside this video. So you can check that out in the description below. Now it's also important to consider what we're going to be seeing at the feet themselves. 
Now, if I was to be shifted over to the right side like that, and my pelvis was turned right, look at what happens to the arches of my feet. I'm going to be higher on the side I'm shifted towards and lower on the side I'm shifted away from. You can think about the arches of your foot representing what's going on at your hip like this. Now, almost everyone has one foot arch that's higher than the other, unless you have just totally collapsed and flat feet. And depending on which one is higher, that can give you additional information as to which side you're biased towards and leaning on. Okay, so based off of all of those things, we have seven total identifying tests that are very simple. We have hip internal rotation, hip external rotation, straight leg raise, hip flexion, shoulder internal rotation, shoulder external rotation, and shoulder abduction. We also have the feet as one other thing, but that's not really an assessment. That is something that's more subjective that can help us understand the grand scheme of things. I do wanna say that this chart is very much inspired from two people that I greatly respect, James Anderson and Mike Cantrell from Applied Integration Academy. I will link their information down below as well. Now, because we have seven total measurements, you're going to have four or more of them put you in one column more than the other. So we can get an understanding of where we are within this chart. Now, generally what we wanna see is as many things as possible in one column. That's going to be good because that says that we're all lined up and we're totally shifted to one side. So let's say that I am in my right side. So I would have a more forward left hip. My right hip's rotated back because my spine is facing the right side. And I also have an upper body that's oriented right a little bit as well but some people will have different layers of compensation and different strategies. Some people will be turned right at their lower body and left at their upper body. And other people will be turned left at their lower body and right at their upper body. So they could have measurements where their upper body says that they're turned towards the left and their lower body says that they're turned towards the right. And if that's the case, I will be addressing that in the article as well. Now, if your assessments tell you you're more over on the right side, that means we have to get you to learn to shift left. What that represents is the ability to push out of your right side and shift into more stance and lateralization on your left side. What that would mean for your hips is that we need to turn your spine to the left and promote more external rotation on the right side and more internal rotation on your left side. And what we would need for the upper body is to also get that to turn left as well. So we can promote better measurements of internal rotation on the right side, external rotation on the left, and shoulder abduction on the left. Now I'm using this right side as an example for a specific reason. Most people are going to be turned towards the right side. Not everyone, but most people. Because there are some studies that suggest that we naturally have a right facing spine and pelvis. And I have more specific content on what makes that up within my video on the left AIC, which I will also link down below. The last major key, and this is why we looked at the foot a little bit too, is that we have to take the foot into account. We have to learn how to properly push from that side we're shifted in into the other side. We have to learn how to turn our spine, turn our hips, and our feet are very important for that. If we're thinking about the gait parallel again, let's say that we're shifted back on the right side into stance on the right. We need to learn how to push out of our right side and shift back into our left. So what that would represent is going from right mid stance to more right late stance and more early stance to mid stance on the left side. So what that means is that we would need to get the foot contacts that are more associated with that. When we shift to mid to late stance, we go from our arch to our big toe. That allows us to create pulsion and push to the other side. When we shift towards the side that's in more early stance, we are more on our heel. So those foot contacts are gonna be important because if I am over on my right side, I'm in this bilateral stance, again, this foot arch is going to be higher because I'm in more of an earlier to mid stance position on this side, I'm turned towards this side. I need to learn how to get the foot arch to push me towards the other side and get on the heel of this side. Let's stick with that example where we are shifted into our right side with a more forward left hip. What we wanna do is get more internal rotation and shifting towards the left side and pull the left side back. 
what we can do is an exercise like this and recruit the hamstring on the back side of the pelvis that will pull that left side back. The purpose of this is to pull that left hip from a forward orientation to more of a neutral orientation. So to set up for this, we need to get in a 90-90 position where we have a 90 degree bend at both our knee and our hip and the feet are flat on the wall. And we have a ball in between our knees that allows us to keep our knees in line with our toes and our knees in line with our hips. So it shouldn't be wider than that. It shouldn't be that much smaller than that. And what we're gonna to do to set up is make sure that we can feel our heels flat on this wall, but we're not gonna peel our toes off. We're gonna keep them flat. And so keeping our hands on our low rib cage, Trevor will have you exhale through your mouth nice and soft as you pull down on that wall with your heels. And again, keeping the whole foot flat, he should feel both hamstrings engage. And he should feel like his tailbone is about an inch or two off of the ground. But if his spine was like Velcro, it's just being peeled one vertebrae at a time off of the ground. But again, he's not going that high. So with both hamstrings engaged, he's now going to do a hip shift. And this is harder than it looks, so make sure you go nice and slow. I'm gonna have Trevor shift his right knee up and his left knee down, which is going to move his hips, and that's okay. And then I'm gonna have him press gently into the ball with just his left side, not his right side. So at this point, he should feel his left inner hamstring and his left groin, inner groin muscle engage. The right side should have maybe a little bit of hamstring, but not a lot of muscular tension is happening on this right side. Once he has that, he's gonna exhale through his mouth, getting all that air out, really all of that soft, five to 10 second exhale until he feels his side abs, not his six pack, but a little bit of side abs, and then hold that tension nice and soft as he inhales through his nose. He should feel his rib cage expand. He's gonna do five breaths of that, maintaining this position right here. The truth is most people are gonna have a really hard time feeling their hamstrings with just that wall reference. So we recommend for most people starting off with something supporting their shin, not their entire leg, but just this portion of the shin so that they can stay at a 90-90 angle. You wanna set it up so that the whole foot can still be flat on something. So we're not off the wall digging the back of our heel into something. The whole foot's flat, and then you should be able to feel a lot more hamstring. But again, this isn't a 10 out of 10 hamstring contraction. It should be a four to five out of 10, maybe six. And then he's gonna come up, pulling down with his heels, and then doing that little shift. And it should be easier for him to maintain that. And what we want to do on the right side is get the pelvis to push from right to left better. And we can do that with an exercise where we're really getting that foot arch reference like this. This is the left side lying right glute max activity from Postural Restoration Institute. To set up for this, we're gonna be on our left side with a small towel roll underneath the left lowest ribs to get us slightly passively side bent to the left. And we also have a little towel roll about three-ish inches thick underneath the lowest foot here, keeping both feet flat on the wall with the toes straight ahead at all times. So what we're gonna do to start here is we're just going to get a very slight tuck of the hips, a little posterior pelvic tilt, and maintaining that, focusing on putting pressure into the wall with the medial arch of the right foot, which is the inner heel and the first met head right here. We're going to slide that right knee forward. Again, make sure the toes are straight on the right. And then we're going to push the knee up as far as we can get it without losing any contact of that right medial heel on the wall at any point. As he does this, he should feel his right lower butt cheek engage, and he should feel a little bit of his right outside hip where his glute meat is too. He's gonna sit here, breathe in through his nose, out through his mouth for about five breaths. If you're having a hard time finding your right glute, what you could do is just take a half step forward with the right foot, and then just do the same exact thing. And that can be enough for some people to feel a lot more right glute. The other thing you can do is put a light band, very light, around the top of the knees, and that should give you just enough resistance to feel your right glute as you go forward and up. The most common mistake on this activity is that people are not going to push the right knee far enough ahead and keep it up. They're gonna have that right knee drift back as they start to get tired, so make sure you're keeping it going forward and up, but not at the cost of losing that right inner foot arch. Make sure that's always the thing that has pressure into the wall, about four to five out of 10. The other thing is that people will try to slide their right knee forward via extending their low back, so make sure that you have that happy medium between keeping the hips slightly tucked 
and pushing the knee as far forward as you can without losing that hip tuck. Eventually you want to get into a standing position and be able to really sense those foot contacts properly and learn how to shift our body weight, not only on the ground, but in an upright environment that mimics the gait cycle. Here's an exercise where you can do that. What we're gonna do here is get something about waist height, like a desk or a box works great. And we're gonna have a book underneath the foot that we're gonna be shifting to. So this is gonna be the left side in this example. And we're gonna take a slight step out with the right side, maybe just slightly wider than hip width. I wouldn't go much wider than that for most people to start. Now, step one, keeping your hands supported on that right there, you're gonna round your back a little bit. Just do a little tuck of the hips. So if your pelvis was a bowl of water, it's not spilling out the front and your ribs are flaring, you're going to tuck it underneath you a little bit. Okay, now the goal here is to feel your whole foot flat on that book. That book's maybe one to two inches thick. That's all it needs to be. And you're going to use your foot arch on the opposite side to push you into your left side, whichever side's on the book. So the outside of your foot is actually going to come off of the ground so you can push through your foot arch. The effort is about a three or four out of 10, not much more than that. So you'll notice that as Trevor did that, he's going to find his left heel and he's going to sort of like get his left hip to come slightly outside of his knee. He's not going so far to where he does that. He wants to just subtly push from the right and get into his left like that. So he's gonna slightly side bend. He's gonna feel his whole foot flat on the left, weights in the heel, maybe a little bit of stretch in his left outside hip, and he's going to feel his right outside hip activate to push him over to the left side. So that's like your glute med area right here. One thing you wanna make sure you do with this activity is as you push from right to left, you wanna make sure that you keep your hips tucked, but also your left knee stays in line with your toes. So if it flares out like that, you're gonna lose your left foot. You wanna make sure that it's going in a little bit. You may feel some left inner thigh adductor muscle, and that's okay, but you do not wanna feel your left hip flexor. If you are, you're probably trying too hard and trying to bend your hips too much and getting into it like that. You don't wanna do that. Make sure you're pretty upright, your hands are supporting yourself, and you're using that right side to sort of push you over. And if you're really struggling to find your right outside hip, you could put the towel roll up against a wall and you could find some way to set up a box close to the wall or whatever works. You could rest your hands on a chair, whatever. And then you could take the right foot and push it into the towel which is resting on the wall for more leverage just make sure you're pushing through your inner heel and ball of your foot underneath your big toe right here and again not a lot of effort i know i sound like i'm, I'm beating a dead horse but if you try too hard you're just going to lock everything up and then you're going to use that to get your hip to go slightly outside of your knee on the left the only big common mistake on this exercise is people are gonna extend their back as they shift left. Make sure you keep a little hip tuck, which will help you stay more neutral as you go into that other side. What we're gonna do here is get in a hip width stance with the toes straight ahead, and we're going to get the left foot ahead one half step length. So the left midfoot is in line with the right toes. We're gonna to get 75% of our weight on our right foot, 25% on our left, unlock both knees slightly. Now, if our pelvis was a bowl of water, we don't want it spilling out the front or the back. We want it nice and neutral, parallel with the floor. And then what we're gonna do is just gently reach the right arm forward, which is going to very slightly turn our trunk towards the left. As we do that, we should feel our left abs very slightly engaged. Now, we're gonna exhale, and every time we exhale, we're gonna gently shift about 10% more of our weight onto our left foot as our pant zipper orients to the left slightly more as well. As he exhales, he's gonna feel more side abs on the left and a little bit more inner thigh on the left as we transfer our weight over to the left. As he inhales, he's gonna hold the position. As he exhales, he's gonna go slightly further. And that's going to help rotate his sternum and his trunk to the left. If you're not feeling your inner thigh on the left, make sure your knee remains unlocked just slightly and your knee is staying over your first and second toe. It's not rotating out like that. If you're having trouble finding your left inner thigh, take a towel roll, roll it up thick enough to where you can get it in your upper thighs and you can keep your knee in line with your toe and your hip so your knees aren't collapsing in too much or being shoved outside. And that'll give you a nice reference to keep that knee in the right place as you go forward with that arm. From a side view, what we can see is as he reaches that right arm, keeping the pelvis neutral, he's still 
keeping his ribs back. He's not extending or slouching. He's making sure he keeps the same amount of height in his skeleton, and he's just gently turning his trunk. That's all the reach is doing. It's not making him do this or arching through the low back. If you wanna know how often you should do these things, I would recommend doing them both in the morning and at night. Two sets of about five breaths per set, really focusing on doing it really well, and also two sets at night of five breaths of those exercises in that order. I'd probably start with just doing the first two really simply and mastering those before you get upright. Because if you get upright too early and you're not ready for it, then it's not really gonna do much for you. So start with the easy ones first, then do the more upright ones in two weeks or so after you master those first ones.